you know, imagine being the first pilot to fly any of those experimental aircraft. That's pretty amazing. That took a lot of guts. So um, that's what I wanted to show you. And I know you have an introduction to do, so I'll, I'll pause it there. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Lowry. Hello, everybody. Um, I am Melissa Jordan. I am part of the WAM leadership team. Um, so we have had you coming together for a talk from Dr. Lowry. She's, I hope you've seen some of our informational emails that we've sent out. So you've had a little chance to read about her background. Um, as Shana mentioned, our ground rules for the meeting is we're gonna have Dr. Lowry do her talk. We love having cameras on, um, microphones off please. But then if you have any questions that you didn't have a chance to send in before, we'll have a chance where we can call on you if you send us a little message in the chat box. Um, and you'll be able to ask your questions at that time to Dr. Lowry directly for more of a conversation. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen with you just so you can get our quick introduction from Wham. Um, there you go. Okay, apologies. You can see how I apply for leave now. <laughs> All right, everybody. So this is our official meeting with Dr. Lowry. We are starting about five minutes after. So I hope you guys have all had a chance to join if you were planning on it. Um, so quick intro for women in aerospace medicine. Um, just in case for those of you who haven't had a great introduction to us yet, um, our mission is to create opportunities for women who are looking for leadership, engagement, mutual support. We wanna create that community for you guys. And as a subsection of AMSRO, there's also a lot of available resources in the community through AMSRO that you guys are able to utilize. Um, so if you guys need anything at all, of course, please reach out to us. Hopefully you have our emails. If not, we'll have you signed up so that we can help connect you with those. This is our current leadership team. Um, I'm the one on the left, so I'm the military member of the team. Um, but we also have great leaders um, who create, who have different positions within the team that they're currently filling. And just as a small plug before we get to the end of our talk when the floor is more open, but we do have opportunities for other people to join the leadership team as well as we start to branch out with um, our capabilities and our goals. So what's happening? So for today, we have our talk with Dr. Lowry, flight surgeon and AME. And then coming up in January, our next talk is with Dr. Uh, Dottie Metcalf Lindenberger, who's an astronaut. Oops, I apologize. Um, so for those of you who had the chance to see our email thus far, this is the short blurb that you were able to get in your email to read a little bit more about Dr. Lowry. Um, if you have a chance to take a look at that, you'll have a little bit more time to read it on your screen, but um, she's got a lot of really great experience. She's been with the Air Force as well as starting um, more extreme environment hobbies outside of that. And she's got a lot of pictures and a lot of great stories for us. So at this point, ma'am, I would like to turn the floor over to you so that you can take over. All right, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen. I'm kicking you off. Yes, ma'am. Okay, there we go. All right, so first of all, thank you to everybody who's out there who decided to spend their Saturday listening to me yammer on about being a flight surgeon. So my focus today is gonna to be more on the operational side of being a flight surgeon. I spent more than 20 years as an Air Force flight surgeon. So that's my background and that's my passion. And I could just say, well, it's the best job in the entire Air Force, probably one of the best jobs in the entire world. Maybe not as good as astronaut, but really good. Uh, so it's a great job for a physician, uh, especially in the military health system. I have gotten opportunities I never would have had anywhere else. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to ramble and happy to answer any questions that you have at the end, okay? All right, so a little bit about my background. I uh, became a flight surgeon in 2000, just sort of by accident. I went to, um, I, I enlisted in the Air Force to pay for school. I didn't have a lot of cash for my undergrad and thought, well, I'm, I'm working my way through school, so I'm probably gonna have to go to some Caribbean medical school, which would have been amazing. But I, I, instead I got into Uniformed Services University and uh, intended to just 
stay in for my initial, um, you know, my initial payback and ended up spending a total of 33 years in the Air Force because I loved what I was doing. Uh, so I spent time as a flight surgeon. I became a board certified aerospace medicine specialist uh, after completing a, the Air Force aerospace medicine residency. I also am certified in Ahmed and uh, have done a preventive medicine residency as well. And family medicine was my initial um, my initial choice of residency programs. So did all that in the Air Force. Uh, I've gotten to go to every continent, which is an amazing opportunity as deployment, working or living. And it was just a real blast. So I'm gonna show you some pictures today. They're all, most of them are mine or belong to my husband, uh, Brian Pinkston. And we just wanna show you around operational aerospace medicine for a little bit. Currently I'm an AME. And Brian and I have a small practice down in St. Petersburg, Florida. and um, these are just some random pictures. Top left was in a C-130. Uh, it's an LC-130, which is the one with the skis, right? Pretty cool if you wanna look that up. Um, then just command pictures, random picture of fun artwork in Antarctica. Those guys are crazy that if, if they can dream up something, they will build it, including homemade fireworks and everything else. So that's sort of Easter Island-esque kind of a sculpture. I got to rappel across a, a 200 foot, 200 foot vertical um, stream bed in Kyr Kyrgyzstan, got to fly a T6. So all of that was amazing. And if you wanna talk about, you know, military or Air Force or even Navy, I can answer any questions on that too. Um, but before I get started, I really wanted to say farewell to Chuck Yeager. As most of you know, he passed away on the 7th of December. What an amazing life, amazing career. And, you know, he's the prototypical fighter pilot. I mean, you can see him there in his older years and he was really pushing the envelope in terms of human performance and space and aviation science and aviation performance, right, of the vehicles. So he was the guy with the right stuff. And Chuck Yeager and people like him is why we exist as flight surgeons. We were really, our, our career field was created because people were, uh, we were having heavy losses in aviation as a result of um, just a lot of people not being selected for the right reasons. So we, they took cavalry officers that were too ill or injured or couldn't physically hack the cavalry back in the early Air Corps days and made them pilots. And we found out later that probably wasn't a good idea because we needed people that were really fit and healthy and could pass some uh, medical scrutiny to fly those aircraft. So we've really evolved over time. You know, you see Chuck Yeager up there, of course, is our prototypical hero. But, you know, those early days of aviation where people were really experimenting and flying by the seat of their pants and they didn't know how fast people could go. They thought that people, human beings, would fall apart if they reached speeds like Mach 1 or faster. So no one knew. And Chuck Yeager was the one that says, well, I can figure this out and strapped on an aircraft and dropped out of an aircraft at about 38,000 feet, 30,000 feet. Feet. And uh, so imagine you're in an aircraft and your aircraft is dropping out of the belly of that other aircraft. So amazing feats of engineering too. And that's why we're here. Now we're back to space and America having a stronger space program again, which is really exciting. And you were talking about some of the launches and, and challenges with those launches before we really got started today. Uh, you see a picture of mission control there on the right as well. And that's a whole new field, right? We're we're still learning about what we can do in space medicine. And then down on the bottom, these are remotely piloted aircraft, which are becoming more and more popular. Uh, of course, people have the little drones that they fly over your backyard and are annoying. Uh, but these are the big, some of them weaponized um, aircraft and they can take out another aircraft and those little drones can take one of these down very easily. They're also at risk because they can be, the video feed from them can be hacked into. So even though it's very secure, that's a challenge for us. And the operational environment that they're in, some of them are deploying, but they work out of a trailer or a Connex box or a small building. So instead of a real cockpit and an aircraft where you can actually feel when you're banking and changes in attitude, imagine the, the human performance complexity that you have by 32 mouse clicks just to put in coordinates or drop a weapon. Um, so it, it's a whole separate challenge that these guys have. And then information overload too. I mean, they've got a phone in there as well. Who has a phone in their cockpit? So that's a challenge for these guys too. And, and it's just, you know, they take a break. They, they're in combat all day. They go home and see their families. That's another challenge. So that's why we're here as flight surgeons to take care of those airmen and their specific unique challenges. This is what we do. I, I happen to be an aerospace medicine specialist, but I'm gonna talk about 
being a RAM or aerospace medicine specialist, but also just a regular flight surgeon, because a lot of people that support us in our line of work are just run in the mill flight surgeons. They may or may not have a residency behind them, depending on where they train. And um, sometimes this is their GMO tour. So they are the most capable physician with just a year of internship under their belt, supporting an entire deployed operation sometimes. So think of your position in training and how much responsibility that is. So in aerospace medicine, we really focus on selection and clinical care of our airmen. Uh, we take care of population health. That's why we're nested under preventive medicine as a specialty, because especially when we're deployed and even when we're in garrison in, in our home base, we take care of the health of the entire population. So we are the health department. We do sexually transmitted disease contact tracing or supervise people that do that. We're the occupational health specialists. We are the uh, human performance specialists as well, trying to get people to complete their missions on time and not get hurt in the process. And then we are the ones that go and deploy everywhere, all ends of the earth and practice medicine in every environment, which is really great. Like what other, what other profession allows you to go and, and one, one day be diving and next day be up on a mountaintop or in a desert and the whole time maybe living in a tent, maybe living on what you have in your bag or uh, deploying to a five-star hotel. You just never know where you're gonna go. So that's what we do, but really bottom line is we are here to support the operational mission. And that was an F-16 cockpit, by the way. So I just wanted to tell you some things about us as flight surgeons, and you guys are all in various stages of this, but we start by being good clinicians. So if you think of a flight surgeon with one year of training, probably not the best scenario, right? We need people that have experience in a variety of medical specialties to go and deploy and take care of our folks both at home and when they're deployed or in combat. So I, I've gotten to do that uh, several times, and it's been it's been a challenge sometimes. It's not always fun, but it's a very rewarding job to go on a deployment. I've also gotten to do some humanitarian work. So the picture in the middle is unfortunately in one of our combat hospitals, uh, combat support hospitals. Um, the one up on the right is uh, humanitarian work that we got to do in Cambodia. And then the one in the bottom, I was just on call from, because you're on call 24 hours a day when you're deployed, but I was just on call and got uh, called in by a guy who broke his nose playing basketball of all things in a combat zone. So a lot of our injuries and illnesses that we have are not combat related at all, fortunately. So one of the things about our specialty is we have to understand the, the environment that our patients are working in. So the picture up on the left, that's a CV-22 Osprey. Hopefully you guys have heard about that. It's a really amazing aircraft in that it can do vertical takeoff and landing VTOL and it's it operates both in fixed wing, uh, which you see there, it's flying forward and back versus a rotary wing um, orientation where it can do that vertical takeoff and landing and then transition its engines and props and fly as a, as a fixed wing aircraft. Really cool, but the aircraft was not designed well for humans in the back. So not pressurized, not oxygenated. So if you're flying at altitude, you have to take special precautions for the crew in the back, otherwise, they'll pass out. They won't be, they won't be crew much longer. Um, so very much a challenge for the people that work in that environment. And that's usually in our special ops and Marine Corps Navy have those as well. Um, then RF-22 has physiologic challenges. You guys have probably read in the news some of the problems that we've had with our oxygenation system our, on our onboard oxygenation system on those aircraft and other fighters. So maybe some of you, especially if you have an engineering background, can go on and work on these types of aircraft and make sure that those problems are engineered out early on in the uh, aircraft acquisition process. The next picture is pararescue. So flight surgeons also take care of pararescue troops. These guys are the ones that you want on your side. They are they're, they're amazing, well-trained humans. Uh, they jump into a combat zone and they will patch you up and take you home. If you go missing, you punch out of your aircraft uh, behind enemy lines. They're the ones that come search for you, pick you up, take you home and put you together in the process. Amazing capability. But we take care of those, those men and women because they're on flying status uh, and jump status, just like our, our pilots are on flying status. Uh, we also to take care of divers. We have a few divers in the Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps have a lot more. Most of our divers are special ops divers, but not all of them. 
So understanding that environment is important as well. So you have to fly, you have to feel the effects of gravity and acceleration on your body uh, to really understand what the pilots are going through as, as well as the neurocognitive demands, you know, especially in a single seat aircraft, they're flying the aircraft, they're calling in waypoints, they're navigating, they are potentially dropping ordnance or operating a surveillance system. They're refueling and talking on the radio. I mean, it's easy to get task overloaded. So it's important that we as flight surgeons fly so that we understand those environments. We are experts in fitness for duty. So this is just a picture of my reminder to say that you can cheat your color vision test. Don't try this at home. But color vision and vision as a whole whole are really important for our pilots and important for our ground crew as well. So this is just one of the many things we test as flight surgeons around the world, regardless of what military or civilian organization, we all test vision and color vision specifically. They need to be able to see lights and symbology and um, it's telling me my internet's bad, sorry. Uh, they need to see, be able to see the, um, you know, it's no longer a round dial analog cockpit. Now everything is on colors and shapes and blinking in terms of alarms and symbology. And they need to be able to see and understand all of that. So one of the many things we test. Um, also regards to medical standards and fitness for duty, sometimes we put people with injuries and illnesses back to work and it's a flight surgeon or an aerospace medicine specialist that has to determine whether or not they're fit for that duty. So on the left, you can see a pilot who lost a leg and we had to make sure he can wear his exposure suit, his personal protective equipment. Can he get in and out of the aircraft? Can he run away from the aircraft if it's on fire? And we test all those things and we make them demonstrate that they can indeed do that. Or if it's an ejection seat aircraft, how is that limb gonna, gonna respond in uh, when they eject and they're going out of the aircraft and they don't maybe have as good of control over that limb as they do their natural limbs. So what is that, the behavior of that extremity in the flail that happens when you eject? So those are things that we have to test. So people like us go to wind, wind tunnels and uh, put our people through different paces out on the aircraft, out of the office to watch them and make sure that these things can happen appropriately before we say they're fit for duty. So the picture on the bottom is Tech Sergeant Meadows uh, and his son, Sar Sergeant Meadows was a combat controller and he was injured in, uh, I think, Iraq or Afghanistan, I can't remember, but he was in a convoy and an IED went off and he lost both of his lower extremities. So as a guy who's been jumping his entire career, he did, he wanted to stay in the military. The Army said, or the Air Force, I'm sorry, he said, no, can't stay. You're not fit for duty anymore. You can't do your job as an active duty airman. Um, but he wanted to jump for his retirement. And some people went, oh, this is going to be horrific. And we said, well, wait, we we might be able to figure this out. So we put him in a wind tunnel. We watched his free fall. He had thousands of jumps anyway. We watched his free fall. We let him experiment with help, you know, as he's doing his fall um, to make sure that his free fall was going to be stable and we weren't going to kill him on the way down. And he got to practice with those artificial limbs, this prosthesis, and he did fine. So uh, you might be involved in helping one of those airmen get back into the cockpit or back to the duty that they love. It's, it's really great to be able to put somebody back to work. And then the picture you see on the top, that was actually a special, special duty diver, lost his extremities and those are prostheses. So he's got a walking prosthesis, a, a running prosthetic, a hiking prosthetic and diving prosthetics. And they have great control and buoyancy in the water. They just have this will to survive that's amazing and it, it's a pleasure to be part of that and actually support it. Unfortunately, you're also part of a safety team. So we do mishap investigation. We have a training course that we attend in all the different services and our civilian aerospace medicine residents also go to this course when it's available to them. But you learn how to conduct a mishap investigation, what went wrong. So this on the left was a C5 that it was an accident where everyone walked away. Huge aircraft, you can see up in the, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but up in the upper left there, the, the fuselage broke. And this is the cockpit on the left side and then the rest of the fuselage running parallel. Um, you can see the, the slides got deployed, the engine fire was put out and everybody walked away from that accident with hardly any injuries. Uh, on the right, you can see that 
the pilot of this aircraft is actually ejecting and getting away from the crash, which is always a good thing. Uh, hopefully his chute deploys and he lands uh, without incident. Sometimes they get deployed, or sometimes there are injuries when they deploy. It's common for them to actually break their spine at about T12, between T12 and L1. Very common injury for, for pilots ejecting. And then if they're too thin or too heavy, there can be problems with them actually getting out of that narrow chute of, a, of an aircraft as the um, chair comes out, the ejection seat. And then we go to the mishap site, we do an investigation, we pick up remains and tag them and identify them and photograph them where they are. And we try to piece together what happened at the end. And sometimes that includes doing a post-mortem examination of the body or looking at the x-rays. And you can see there, it's a like a, a foot pedal injury where somebody was trying to, to exhibit control over their aircraft and they were actively trying to control it probably at the time that it crashed. So we try to look at the human factors and medical causes. Did we miss something on our exam? Did they fail to disclose something on their exam? Were they taking their wife's antidepressant? Who knows? So we look for things like that. We also look at their, we do blood testing and toxicology for everyone that touched the aircraft, including the maintainers. Uh, we also respond to the incident and support the first responders on scene and take care of any survivors and medically support the, um, the recovery and, re and rescue teams as well. Sometimes we also have to do disaster response. So as a flight surgeon, you're out there leading the medical portion of a disaster response. Uh, this of course, is our Pentagon after 9-11 or on 9-11 or 9-12. Um, the picture up on the upper right was from a combat air patrol that was scrambled in uh, right after 9-11 to see what was going on and where was the next plane and next threat going to come from. I was, I guess, fortunate or unfortunate as the case may be to participate in some of that and take care of some of our senior leaders as they are making decisions on threat reduction, threat mitigation, how we responded. Uh, we were in charge of testing some of the white powder. We were in charge of looking at the Pentagon to see if it was habitable enough because President Bush said, I want this to look like as business as usual. You didn't hurt us. We're going back to work in the Pentagon. So we were there scrambling and testing to make sure it was safe for people to go in from an occupational and exposure point of view. And then the picture on the right is actually our Surgeon General. That was General Carlton. He was a flight surgeon, surgeon and um, also a pilot. So he happened to be at the Pentagon. Of course, that's where his office was that day. And we had all just practiced between bowling Air Force Base across the river and the Pentagon. We had practiced an aircraft crash scenario a few weeks prior. So it was pretty ironic. So everyone kind of knew what to do. And, and uh, we, it was fresh in everyone's mind, unfortunately. So General Carlton was there in his polyester pants and his blues rescuing people and, and dragging them out of the, the building as it was still on fire. And a lot of heroism that day is pretty interesting story. And this is um, more just pictures of the, the badness that happens, right? So this is uh, Operation Tomodachi or the Fukushima disaster is probably what you all know it as. This is a huge radiation contamination. And so flight surgeon and aerospace medicine specialists were there looking at the plume modeling, which you can see on the right, you know, where's that plume going and who's going to be threatened by the plume? And what kind of actions do we take to uh, protect people within that plume? We do uh, triage. You can see the guy in the middle there. He's wearing his, his medic red cross. I identify him as a medic, but he's got all these different triage tags. And we do triage a variety of different ways, but that's something that we practice on the base constantly. And different bases have different missions, right? So it depends on where you are, depends on how frequently you, you uh, practice this task. Uh, we have deployment exercises and actual deployments. So some of our disasters, we can set up a mobile, we call it an EMEDS, which you can see on the lower left. They come in green and, and tan, and we can take those rapidly on a pallet. They're pre-palletized pre and pre-stored, and we can take them up and set them up, take them anywhere and set them up within 24 hours and be seeing patients within an hour, the first hour on the ground. And the first medic that goes is usually a flight surgeon. So it, it's great to be first boots on the ground as you're trying to figure out where the dining facility are is going to be, where's the mess tent, where the showers and latrines, how would we keep our food and water safe and potable, and by the way, I'm seeing patients too, so that's a challenge. 
And then some disasters come with contamination like Fukushima. So we also practice decontaminating our people and we supervise that on an emergency scene. Uh, and then we, we run lots of mass casualty exercises, not because we like it, but because we know it, we are a target and we wanna be a hard target and be prepared when it comes to medical response. Talked about deployments a little bit. This is kind of a cool thing. This is air to air refueling on the lower left. If you've ever seen that, it's a big tanker full of gas, a flying gas tank essentially. And they have this little tiny boom that a guy with a high school education flies to intercept with that fighter at, at you know, you're going, 300 miles an hour, you have to be above stall speed, right, for both aircraft. So you're traveling pretty fast, and this little airman is flying this boom towards your face in the fighter. Uh, usually works out pretty well, but that's a capability that we have that gives us a persistent presence over the sky. So those tankers just fly, we call it a racetrack. They're just going round and round and round, and they have rally times for each of these fighter aircraft to come and get gas. It's a flying gas station. The middle one is another, uh, deployment thing that we support or we're part of. This is um, chaff and flares, we call it. So if you haven't seen that before, look it up. There's some really good videos. But this is a C-130 gunship. And when a missile comes at it, they deploy this chaff and flares. The, the flares are, are magnesium heated. So theoretically, they burn hotter than the engines in the aircraft. And they have, we, they have to be taken care of especially. So we check our aircraft maintainers and people that pack these things very carefully for occupational hazards and exposures. Um, so that's the, the flares. The chaff comes out and dazzles um, uh, radar guided missiles. So it, it creates like a, a dazzle effect. So it confuses the missile so that maybe it'll miss the aircraft and fly towards this dazzle. It basically obscures the aircraft in that process. And then on the right is just a picture at one of our deployed bases. It, it's dusty, it's hot, it's not a friendly environment. There, You don't have a lot of privacy, but we love to deploy. And this is, again, what our airmen are facing, so we need to be able to understand that environment as well. We are also experts in air medical evacuation. And the, I included this picture because the top left is actually a flight surgeon. Anybody know who that might be? Famous flight surgeon that was a POW? Come on your mic if you if you got it. I'll give you a second. I don't not seeing anything. And she's not recognizable in that picture, but uh, that's Rhonda Cornum. So she was a flight surgeon. She was captured and was a POW for a period of time. Her husband, so she was Army, Army flight surgeon. Her husband is an Air Force, was an Air Force flight surgeon uh, as well. So Anyway, interesting factoid, but you, because of your role as a flight surgeon, this could be you, you could be taken, you're a combatant when you're flying, uh, even though as a medic, you're not a combatant, you're a combatant when you're flying in a military aircraft that's involved in an offensive maneuver. And you could be dropped behind enemy lines, taking care of people, doing your job as a medic and still get rolled up as a POW. So we take special training to know how to deal with that. Um, picture on the right is just one of our C-130s. That's kind of how they're configured. Uh, it's not fancy, but it's air medical evacuation to the next higher echelon. So there's a lot of things that our, our flying air crew help position patients and get our patients ready to go. And that first, that one on the lower left is actually a Jenny. That's the first aircraft that we use in air medical evacuation. Doesn't look like a comfortable ride. I mean, you're, you're kind of on a stretcher and, and hooked somehow secured uncomfortably in this aircraft, not really well protected from the elements or anything like that, but it worked. And we got better and we've evolved over time. Now we have the C-17, which is really a nice, this is the Cadillac of AirVac. And this is the one that does the milk runs from our combat zones back to Ramstein and other places where people get definitive treatment. So that's uh, C-17 in the lower left, just massive. You can see how many patients are, are there. There's at least two rows of litters, if not three, unfortunately. Good news is we haven't been flying as many of those missions lately, which is, is nice. And we also take our coalition partners in those aircraft and drop them off at Ramstein, or sometimes we take them other places as well. And then you can just see different deployed pictures of how we transport our casualties. Sometimes we have an ambulance downrange, sometimes we don't. Sometimes it's just a litter. Uh, or sometimes it's people carrying a litter. We don't have a fancy distribution system. 
And then sometimes you're using an aircraft of opportunity. So the one on the right is actually an Airbus. We were in Antarctica and had a cardiac patient. We didn't have any C-130s scheduled to go between our, the continent and New Zealand. We would have had to wait. And the Aussies are great, right? They're, they're always willing to do stuff. We said, hey, are, is it possible to use your Airbus for uh, an Aravac we're, or a Medivac? We're doing, uh, we have a patient, a cardiac patient, and you guys are going back to Hobart. Any chance you could do it? And they said, well, we knew that it was possible and we know where a patient would go in the back and how to configure the seats back towards the galley, but we've never done it. Let's try. And so we did it and the patient survived. Um, he might not have survived if he'd had to wait. So sometimes you just have to use the aircraft that you have or the vehicle that you have to get your patients out. It's not always by air, unfortunately. Um, okay, so then we are also interested in human performance, which I know some of you guys are. This is early on, flight surgeons have been involved in doing human performance testing and human performance augmentation, uh, especially in the early days of the space program. So we need to understand human physiology and how the body responds to different environments. So we study night vision goggles, which you can see on the right, and learn how to teach people how to use those things. We take part in a training in an altitude chamber. So on the bottom left and bottom right, those are both altitude chamber pictures. The one on the right is some altitude uh, we we're doing a study in Chile with the Chilean Air Force. So if you drop somebody in at high altitude, you insert troops up on a mountaintop, who's gonna be susceptible to uh, hypoxia and uh, altitude illness? We don't know. So we were trying to find a biomarker uh, to see who was the most susceptible and either then subsequently try to train that out of them or try not to do that to those people and only insert the people that were the most robust or least susceptible. So we do lots of altitude chamber work. And then the middle one is a, different than an altitude chamber. It, it provides via a mask, like a, a, a fighter you know, pilot mask, same kind of mask as you're seeing in the lower left picture in the, in the chamber. You put on that mask and it dials in a differential partial pressure of oxygen. So it's hypoxia, but there's no pressure changes. So it's a lot less risky for our participants and our observers. Um, and then we try to simulate the cockpit and watch the light loss and different things that hypoxia causes and confusing, confusion and mental status changes. So we try to show them that via this reduced oxygen um, trainer, essentially. And then we also look at fatigue. And the picture in the middle is my reminder that circadian rhythms are, are also something that we really focus on. So I think that one was about two in the morning. I was on call and going to the clinic one night and just that's a sundial, 24 hour sundial. And just it's a recognition and a reminder that we need sleep and in 24 hours of light or darkness or traveling between a lot of time zones, humans fatigue and we need to find ways to get better sleep, get solid sleep, sometimes through the use of pharmaceuticals. It's not a replacement for good sleep, but sometimes we use them to help us reset our time zones. Uh, in the military, sometimes we use go pills too, uh, caffeine or stimulants to enable people to do their job. And we could talk separately about the ethics of that, whether or not it's good. Um, but we do try to minimize the use of medications as we try to increase their tolerance and human performance. And then we support operations like this. This is a centrifuge at Wright Pat. And I'm not gonna play the whole video, but you can kind of get an idea of what these things look like. There you go. Oh, nope. Spoiler. Here we go. And the sound cuts out on part of this video. I apologize. Fast forward while it does that. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was working this morning. I'm going to skip it. Anyway, Google Centrifuge, Wright Patterson has good music, um, but I want you to see this thing spinning like crazy. And I'm sorry it's not working. I really checked all these links again this morning. Yeah, Take not going to work. Yeah. Anyway, it's a lot of fun. But this is what it looks like on the inside. Uh, this is a 9G, um, 9G 
flight. Uh, we have to do that to be able to fly in fighter aircraft. We all have to go through that, pilots and flight surgeons supporting them. And it's a blast, as you can see. <laughs> I look like I'm about 100. So anyway, if, if you haven't ever had the opportunity to do one and someone gives you an opportunity for a, team, uh, for a, a flight, you should take it. And then we also have to understand the, the issues of people coming back from space. So what is the effect on the human body after being weightless when you come back from the ISS? This is actually a picture of two flight surgeons. The one on the right is Mike Barrett. He's an astronaut. And he uh, sitting next to him is Ed Powers. They were both Wright State Aerospace Medicine Program graduates. And Dr. Barrett there is He's enamored by the behavior of liquids because he hasn't seen water behave like that in the six months that he's been on the ISS. So he's just finding marvel in how liquids work on Earth. So we also understand uh, altitude and depth. So this is a picture of the NBL on the right in the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. You guys might have seen this before in some other presentations, but this is a huge swimming pool. It's it used to have a mock-up of the space shuttle, and now it's got a mock-up of the ISS. So we need to train our, our, our astronauts how to do their tasks in zero G or weightlessness. So the next best thing we have on water, or the next best thing we have is the water for them to practice those tasks. So they suit up, big space suit, um, tailored to the water, of course, and then they do a mock-up of whatever repair or task that they have to do, because when they try to turn a wrench, their body turns. The wrench, the part doesn't necessarily get turned. They rotate around the wrench sometimes, so they have to learn how not to do that when they are neutrally buoyant or in a zero G environment. So we have divers that support this and flight surgeons that support this operation as well. And then on the left is, an, is a uh, hyperbaric chamber. So not an altitude chamber, but a hyperbaric chamber where we are doing some exercises to see how long people can last in a chamber with the given breathing gas that they have, just ambient air, uh, how long can they survive at pressure before they pass out and we have to bring them back up to the surface. These are just different, different chambers. These are hyperbaric chambers. Uh, the gamma bag, which is a portable, um, it adds part of an atmosphere in case somebody has mountain sickness or potentially the bends, although it's not great for the bends. Uh, the one on the lower right is a little bit more stable, another mono place chamber. This is a, a hyperlate. And this is what we have for pilots, for example, at the South Pole. They bring one of these in case they get stranded. Uh, coming from McMurdo is sea level going up to the South Pole, which is an altitude of about 10,000 feet, barometric pressure, altitude, and physical altitude. So they would be susceptible for getting altitude on this. We don't want that in our pilots. So they travel with one of those hyperlates. We also have diving operations on McMurdo, which you can see on the left, uh, diving, scientific diving. They're doing experiments and capturing critters on the seafloor uh, down under the ice. So understanding ice diving and a bit about that cold water physiology is important. And we also have a hyperbaric chamber. So if you're the flight surgeon on McMurdo, whether you're active duty or you are a civilian contractor, you need to know something about hyperbaric medicine as well. And those are Navy divers for our, our uh, Navy, Navy uh, folks there in the middle. We do humanitarian medical operations. We deploy everywhere. This was this um, one on the bottom was Haiti. We did a lot of relief work in Haiti. We do in, injections and immunizations. And this other one on the right and left were humanitarians that we did in Peru uh, as part of our preventive medicine course. We're also the public health and preventive medicine experts. So we look at disease surveillance. We look to see whether the food that our people, when they're deployed, whether it's safe or not, you know, can they eat food out of that market? Can they go to that restaurant? We try to give guidance, right? So that people don't get sick while they're on these deployments. Because again, our job is to support the operational mission, right? We work with other countries, NATO and ASIC specifically, the Air and Space Interoperability Council and North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So we do lots of work with our, our flight surgeon partners and we all get along really well. It's a really small career field, aviation medicine is. So it's nice to see our colleagues every year at these meetings and conferences. And we try to do interoperable tasks and have interoperable equipment so we can work as a coalition and have the same medical standards and the same equipment standards so that when we have to rely on one another, the equipment is interchangeable. 
And then we do mentorship in some of these other countries. So trying to give them money, build up infrastructure. These are more humanitarian, diplomatic, USAID types of projects. So the, top, the one on the top, we were doing a needs assessment in Afghanistan outside the wire. And this is an operating room with bits of human tissue after they've cleaned it. Still tissue on, you know, it doesn't look sterile to me, but that's clean for them. Then when they threw out their garbage, it ended up in a heap. Rats, lots of stray animals uh, were coming in. And then they, someone was nice enough to give them a bunch of ventilators, but they, or I'm sorry, ventilators and um, incubators for the babies at a mom and baby hospital, but they didn't have power. So if you give medical supplies without a power supply, it, it's not always ethical. It's not always the right thing to do. So you, you might be involved in some of this humanitarian work as well. And then a completely empty brand new ICU with nothing in it and no one trained to staff it. But another country spent a lot of money on that ICU thinking it was a good capability. So just some ethical things to keep in mind. One of my favorite things is search and rescue and survival. So we train for those sorts of things. Uh, we have survival school in um, mostly in the Pacific Northwest, but the Army and Navy do survival in different places as well. And you learn how to live off the land, how to survive undetected or relatively undetected. We all get captured and then we learn how to, how to survive in captivity and some things that you can do to increase your chances of coming home alive. Uh, so we have different environments that we work in, polar, jungle, mountain, um, sometimes those, the places that we work are contaminated with radiation. This one on the bottom is a, is a radioactive waste site that was leaching into our groundwater at one of our bases. And so we were exposing people to radiation and we, we don't like that. So we uh, invited the Department of Energy out to help us mitigate that. And then the one on the far left is actually the Diploma in Mountain Medicine. It's part of the high angle rescue training that we did. And then most of us have a sense of humor. You can see I'm with stupid right there. That's kind of funny. It's probably a flight surgeon in the back. Um, and I hope no one's offended by the one on the lower right, but that's something that a pilot would wear on the back of his helmet. And it's basically the standard briefing for any joker that's in the back seat, right? Because a lot of these, these um, two-seater aircraft, they don't want anyone ejecting them. They don't want anyone breaking anything. So sit down, be quiet, don't touch anything. Uh, it's just kind of a, a, a humorous thing. So please don't be offended. Uh, that, the one in the upper right is a flight surgeon in a wheelchair made out of an ejection seat, which is pretty hilarious, I think. And it looks like it might be in a squadron bar, so or heritage room or squadron meeting room of some sort. And then the one on the right is just stuff that my people did, just making fun of me, because you, you just make fun of each other in a good, good natured way. It's team building, I suppose. All of those little quotes have a story, but I'm not going to bore you with those today. And then occupational health is one of the other specialties we look at. So we go and do sampling in different industrial shops to make sure that people aren't being exposed to too much of a hazard. And we do monitoring for toxins and hazards in their blood and do an occupational exam every year. We also do some travel medicine, uh, again, looking at prevention mostly. That's leishmaniasis on the lower left. And then a typical market that you might see if you're deployed somewhere and you go, if you're allowed to go outside the wire. So we look at food and water safety and uh, disease prevention and mitigation, things like prophylaxis and um, sometimes medications and different things to tell our airmen and our deployers so that they don't get sick. And then also we are involved in teaching and leadership. I've, I've gotten to teach at in other countries and uh, fortunately at the Air Force Aerospace Medicine Program, UTMB and a bunch of other places. It's just been, I've been fortunate to go and be involved in our Aerospace Medical Association, do some presentations there when I was a lot younger. Um, but it's really nice to be able to, to try to give back to the community and tell people how much fun aerospace medicine is and give people an idea of you know what what the career entails and what you can do and I've gotten to go everywhere we as flight surgeons have an adventurous spirit we love to go places we love to do things with our the people that we're supporting so that was the the ferris wheel is actually up at the russian space center which has uh, gary powers u2 parts of it they don't let you take pictures we snuck a few but they didn't turn out very well and we didn't want to go to prison so we didn't get any more um but 
you know, the desert, the mountains, the South Pole, uh, the middle one is Serena and Young Chancellor, another astronaut. She's actually using a fundoscope to look at the back of her eye on the ISS. We always go first class. But sometimes we go by river, sometimes we stay in a hut, sometimes we stay in a tent. Sometimes we're traveling in the back of a C-17 that's packed, jam-packed with people and cargo. And sometimes you're on a tuk-tuk. So I, I hope I've given you some things to think about as a flight surgeon and I just leave you this with this poem. Basically, being a flight surgeon is a fantastic opportunity, whether you're taking care of pilots or being an AME uh, on the outside of the military or you're taking care of astronauts. It's just great to be able to be part of something that's just so unique and uh, so challenging and it'll take you everywhere, anywhere you want to go. So that's about all I have to say. I'm going to stop sharing and see what questions you guys have. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowry. That was a great talk. Fellow UCIS grad. So I love it. <laughs> Coming in <laughs> 2021. Um, okay, so we had a few questions that were kind of sent in ahead of the talk and then I'll open up the floor. We've gotten a few messages since you started. Okay. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen. Did I stop sharing for you? You can do it, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So one question that we had sent in ahead of time was someone who specifically they're a physiotherapist, but just advice for people um, or interactions you've had with people who are not MDs in the flight surgery field. I would say, um, yeah, I would say look at the Aerospace Medical Association. We have different groups within that organization. We have physiologists, we have nurses, we have scientists. So I would take a look at that and see what information you can get. Uh, engineering is great. Physiotherapy and physiology is really important. We have actually people working at NASA and doing sports medicine types of things. And um, for, for example, making sure that we have our astronauts have good range of motion in their shoulders to be able to get in and out of the suits. So asthma is a good place to start. And then if you have specific questions, I'd be happy to um, take an email and put you in touch with the right person based on your interest. But asthma is a good place to start. Perfect. They have a website, uh, asma.org. Perfect, thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think we answered some of these other questions on the slide very well with the talk already. So I was gonna go ahead and look at turning it over to the floor. Um, Gabriella, are you still in the chat? Maybe. Okay, we can come back for Gabriella. Um, she was just asking, um, Maybe not directly for you, ma'am, but as a non-U.S. citizen trying to navigate. Sorry, sorry. Well, she is here. I think she might. Gabriella, I see you in the chat. Are you able to unmute yourself? Yes. Perfect. Hi, you can um, go ahead and ask. Sorry, this is just, um, uh, thank you for your talk. It was amazing. Um, I'm very interested in doing something like this, but obviously I'm from the U.K., and I've had a lot of trouble trying to navigate finding internships or experience um, at NASA um, looking at this specifically. Uh, do you have any suggestions of how people who aren't from the US um, can navigate these spaces? Because um, it's obviously quite difficult to get experience and then know that this is what you wanna go into later um, if you've not seen it firsthand. So I did see Shana has a link to the Shane, I thought you put a link to NASA's internship program. Yes. Yes, ma'am. There are internship opportunities available in more than 23 countries. Um, yeah. And through the yeah, so I've, I've seen those. Um, and the ones for obviously the UK were linked to the ESA. Um, but it is, so is, there, is it impossible to end up in the States? Is, it, is my question at NASA. It, it, you know what? I'm going to actually ask if, if Bonnie is in the room. Uh, squadron leader, are you here? And can you <laughs> do our Royal Air Force and uh, just, how to navigate this? She just posted in the chat. So Bonnie would be a great resource for that. Yeah, it's, I, yes. Are you I, here? I'm, I'm not trying to uh, take over the conversation. So Gabriella, we can maybe, um, Shana can link us up um, afterwards. I'm a resident in aviation and space medicine in the UK. It's very small compared to the US. So there are fewer opportunities, um, 
but there are opportunities. Um, uh, if you are completely convinced on um, uh, space medicine in particular, then yes, there are routes to, to working in the US, but they do involve quite big seismic shifts in trying to get um, citizenship and uh, your qualifications in, uh, in the US. But in the short term, there are definitely other routes. There's the short course at UTMB. That's a four week um, course that does um, uh, gets you into links with uh, NASA. Uh, in the UK, in the last year, we've set up the next generation aerospace medicine. It's uh, linked underneath the Royal Aeronautical Society. Uh, and that's a way to find other people in the UK, similar minded people, get mentorship um, uh, and kind of, so if you just search next generation aerospace medicine, if you um, message Shana, she can pass you my details. I'd be more than happy to chat with you um, about other things that we can we can get you involved in. But, but in summary, there are fewer opportunities, unfortunately. Um, uh, and uh, maybe you, can I, you and I can chat offline about um, other things you can do. Amazing, thank you so much. I'll get your details. <laughs> and Bonnie is a fantastic re resource and you can do the short course without being a US citizen, but you can't always access all of the NASA tours and other things that that, that um, program has to offer as a non US citizen. Um, and then there's training. Yeah, program. I, oh, go ahead. Sorry, um, I actually emailed um, that course uh, to find more information about applying. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm only a first year medical student, but I have some other degrees. Um, but they haven't actually responded. It's been over a month, so I'm not sure. Are they not running that anymore this summer? Or, um, the short course has... should be running. Um, that's okay. the best, to my knowledge, it is going to run. That would be the last week in June and the first three weeks in July. And it okay. this last year has been online. So it's, yeah, it's again, it's, it's new territory for everyone. It, it may be that they're still working out the particulars, but the okay. good news, the good news is that you're not going to miss anything. We're all, or rather, we are all missing the same things. So uh, regardless of your citizenship, which shouldn't be a factor anyway, we're all going to be able to partake of whatever level experience is available this year. That's the plan. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. And then one question that did come up, I think inspired by all of your amazing military travels and picks, um, was they were asking as medical students, um, not necessarily military or USIS, but um, what opportunities there may be to get involved with those types of analog environments or working with aerospace docs. Okay, so in terms of analog environments, there is the Mars Trainer, the Red Risk School that's put on by Trish, Translational Research Institute for Space Health. I encourage you to look at their website. They have a lot of fantastic and often free uh, courses and webinars you can participate in. The, the Mars simulation takes people of all types, not even all physicians, just all types of people, just interested, people that are interested in the space environment. You can also, uh, places like Antarctica, all of the countries that have bases down there all need support. So whether or not you're medical, uh, once you're a physician, you can do medical support, apply for that. But also, you know, we, we treat that as a space analog for our residents and some of our astronauts. So you take advantage of, um, you know, doing a, doing a job or a support role. Um, we also are going to be doing a, we have a, a company called Kinetic Medical Adventure Education, Adventure Medical Education, and we are going to be doing a, a whole space and aviation program here soon as an introduction, just to give people an idea. We do a lot of hands-on work, but right now with COVID, we haven't done a lot of hands-on this year, but we're hoping to travel and do some space and aviation related education here in the near, near future. A lot of it'll be over Zoom. Um, and then in terms of analogs, uh, Wilderness Medical Society is good. World Extreme Medicine is good. If you wanna check that out, that's based out of the UK. And National Outdoor Leadership School is also good for training in the outdoors. And then you can consider those things as analogs to space travel where you're far from home with limited resources. Hope that helps. Undergraduates, please apply to Brooke Owens. I'm putting the link here. Um, there's a series of, of new fellowships coming online all the time, but Brooke Owens is the paid internship and executive mentorship program that's been around the longest. They partner you with people from Boeing, Airbus, NASA, 
uh, Axiom Now, uh, ULA, you name it. So if you if you meet the criteria, please apply or even just apply. I always go for it. Um, but there are Brooke Owens Fellows in this room and then people uh, who are mentors for Brooke Owens uh, Fellows. So please consider that. Um, you can get yourself hooked up with the Space Generation Advisory Council. They're doing projects all the time. Their latest project that they're launching is in nutrition, uh, space nutrition. So if something that's interest you, please do that. Please get yourself mentors. We're working on setting up our mentorship <laughs> families. Uh, it's not here straightforward, but we're, we're putting that together. And um, stick around because we're a community and we're growing. Hopefully we'll all get the chance to get together at uh, asthma in person. Um, but we'll know more as March approaches. Um, and I'm also, I've just been posting some links to various things as we go along, like the, the Student's Guide to Career in Space, the Space Talent Organization. I'm not sure quite what they do yet, but they seem um, to be trying to put together a, um, collaborate, a collaborative place for people to put their internships. And that would be a really useful resource. So I'm keeping my eye on them, but I did post their guide to uh, their student's guide to a career in space on there. So you can feel free to keep an eye on what they're doing. Thank you. Um, there was a question about having a military background and whether or not that's absolutely necessary. I'd say no, it's not necessary. It's it's interesting because we are forced to think on our feet and be able to live through some austerity and make some sacrifices that the rest of our society doesn't necessarily have to make. So I think it's helpful, but it's nice to have a, a, a diverse team. So it wouldn't be the best if everyone had military experience. It's nice to have a variety of people and variety of experiences to support our astronauts. And then the biggest challenge for exploration class missions, I think the biggest challenge is, is being able to support them. I think it's, it's also, um, I don't know, it, it's just really tough to understand how to support them for the duration of time that they're going to be gone, these long duration missions. We don't know how we're going to react. We are working on what we do when people die. Uh, so it's just how, how do you support the humans in that environment and give them hope that you're going to keep supporting them and, you know, in an environment where they may not have communication for 24 hours or more. So I think that's a challenge for us, both logistically as well as physically um, and psychologically as well. I think, you know, the science is there. Of course, now that we've civilianized space, I think that's really good because there's competition and that helps drive the industry forward faster, uh, in my opinion. Um, let me see. And then please come check out our classes on kinetic CME and motion.com. We don't have a ton up there right now, but we're advancing, moving forward with our aviation um, curriculum soon. And we're excited to be able to offer those classes while we're all staying home and recovering from COVID. We have a, a hyperbaric trip coming up in Fiji uh, or dive medicine, uh, marine medicine trip in Fiji in the fall. If you guys have any availability and want to go diving and learn some learn some medicine on top of it, um, come on over and check us out. What other questions do you have for me? Um, it looks like we've beat it through most of the list, ma'am. Um, Mihoko asked a second question about besides mentorships and internships, what are ways as an undergraduate student to um, decide whether aerospace medicine is a good fit? Um, just for personally speaking, this is probably a little bit of a segue to our final slide from WAM updates as well, but um, I think that mentorships is a really great way to get started with that. Um, you'll be able to speak with people who have experience in the field or who are working their way through gaining those experiences. Um, and I think that they can also help put you in contact with some of those experiences yourself where you can see what they do. Um, so for WAM, we're trying to help sort of facilitate that as well. So we have our wonderful uh, mentorship leader, Ms. Shilpi. She's been working really hard on getting together a mentorship family for us. And so what that means is that we're encouraging all of our members to work both as a mentor and a mentee. So we have um, a sign-up sheet that we have available to try to get involvement and information from you. That'll include potentially like where you're currently located. We have members on multiple continents. So that just helps us to sort of key you in with people who may be more able to directly help you. 
um, as well as your interests, whether you're looking for research, whether you're looking for just information, connections, a sense of community. Um, and from there, we're looking to connect people who are either um, undergraduates looking for current med students, med students looking for residents, residents looking for attending level physicians, and just sort of building that tree so that there's always someone who can provide you with that information and that support while you try to make your way through aerospace medicine. But then also, if you're looking for learning about experiences that they've had and seeing if it's a good fit for you as well. Um, small way unplugged, but I think that that's really probably a really great place to start for if you're an undergrad. And then uh, also you can, uh, a big plug for ASAMS, the Aerospace Medicine Student and um, Student Resident Interest Group. You don't have to be even a medical person to take part in that as long as you have an interest in your student. They are very welcoming and they have a good, um, they have links to other mem members of the community that can serve as mentors, answer questions about your specific field or your specific interest. And so that, that's a really good group. And uh, you can always reach out to me as well with, with questions. Yeah, I mean, to that, if you're just wondering, is this for me? Should I jump into an internship or, or invest in some larger, like the short course at NASA is great, but there's a cost associated with it. There's costs associated with a lot of these things. The free resources uh, that you can avail yourself of, I put them in the box. Which is Red Risk School, um, which Cheryl mentioned, which is outstanding. And just a very, very quick intro to the very, very nuts and bolts of aerospace medicine is UTMB's aerospace medicine series. It's on the AMSRA website that, that we were just talking about, the, the medical student and resident in church group. Totally free. You can watch it at times two speed on the on the you know on the treadmill if you like. Um, but that if those are engaging for you, if you find that kind of medicine interesting, if you keep look, if you keep clicking on the links to watch the next lecture, then you're probably in the right place. Um, but even if you're not, we'd like you to hang out and help you be in the right place or just be a part of the community. So avail yourself of those things. And then, you know, we'll see, we'll see as COVID, you know, processes through what else comes online. But given that we just chose 18 people to go to the moon, Given that Axiom, which didn't exist a year ago, Axiom Space is looking for a medical director. These are just, this is expanding. These opportunities are, are gonna be expanding ever, ever broader. So feel free to stick around if you've decided this is the place for you and uh, we'll build a community here for sure. Are there can I can I just give a plug? There's two flight surgeons amongst those 18 people, 18 astronauts. There's two flight surgeons on that, on that set, on that list. Yeah, they're very cool people. All right, do we have any other questions for Dr. Lowry while we have her? Hmm. Don't have anything else coming up in my chat. All right, mentoring under, yes, great, Nina. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. the, the idea of a mentorship family is, you know, lots of, even high school schoolers, high school schoolers to undergrads, undergrads to grads, grads to medical, medical to in practice and then we just pull people through you know we develop these networks that last a lifetime so the setup is going to take a little while thank you for your patience well thank you all for your time today i really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk to you and your attention and your really good thoughtful questions i appreciate your time thank you very much dr lowry we really appreciate it congratulations thank to you guys for putting this together this is a fantastic group and you're doing a great job and lastly, if everyone's still here, we are going to be putting in a bulk order for the new Women in Space patches. Uh, we'll send those out over email, over the chat, and uh, we're just waiting to get price quotes. So we'll send you a link to sign up if you guys want to order those patches, and we can see if we can get a bulk discount when they become available next year. Happy holidays, everyone. See you in January for Dottie Metcalf's talk. It's going to be great. And thank you again, Dr. Lowry. Feel free to join us anytime. We hope you do. Thank you very much. Happy holidays, you guys. Thank you.